Hi, this is Dominique and Greg Nelson of Nelson Construction and Renovations. And today we're gonna to talk to you about why most Florida homes are made of concrete block. Stick around till the end for some bonus information about Florida hurricane codes. You've probably noticed that most homes in Florida are built with concrete cinder block, also known as CMU or concrete masonry units. You may find that only the first floor is made of block while the upper stories are made of wood framing, as in the case of this development that we're doing on Indian Rocks Beach. Or you may see homes built from foundation to roof, concrete all the way up, as in this custom home that we're building on Clearwater Beach. However, in Florida, we still do wood framing because it meets building code. The Florida building code allows us to build in several different ways. So if it's okay to build with wood framing down in Florida, then why do most builders opt for concrete block? You got kind of like a bronze, silver, gold. You've got wood framing down at the bottom. You've got block as your next tier being block, first floor, wood frame, second floor. And then your third tier would be all concrete, but even up there on the third tier, you've got a couple of different options. In Florida here and a lot of the southern states, we have a problem with termites. Um, there's different types of termites. They have subterraneans, which are the ones that live in the mud, and they'll crawl up, and they'll eat the wood, and then they'll go back down. And then you have the swarming kind, which kind of move from house to house in a, uh, you know, picking them like the lottery. And then they'll get into the wood, and they'll eat it up and uh, create a structural damage and all sorts of havoc. That's the first consideration on why anybody would want to move to concrete block. The second reason is that concrete is more energy efficient than wood framed houses, both in sound deadening and soundproofing the home and also temperature wise. So you can save money on your air conditioning bill and do a lot better on the climate controlling inside your house if it's built out of concrete block. Concrete block is a, a lot thicker. A standard concrete masonry unit is eight inches wide and eight inches high and 16 inches long. They call them eight by eight by 16s. But your typical two by four is four inches, so it's smaller. Of course, you can get wider ones. You can get two by sixes, two by eights, and you can frame the envelope of a house out of a larger piece of lumber, but then you still have to insulate it. So with concrete block, it comes eight inches and it's also got an airspace in it. So you have this built-in space where um, it, it helps with the insulation. Concrete block can also get injected with a foam that's made to insulate it, which pushes your thermal barrier to the outside of the house. But it's much more energy efficient uh, as far as, you know, keeping the house insulated, keeping it cooler, that sort of thing. The other thing that I wanted to mention with concrete block is that concrete block uh, won't dry rot. So if there's ever any kind of water infiltration or uh, you know if rain gets through the outer envelope and gets onto it it's not going to cause rotten wood dry rot mold that sort of thing whereas with wood framing if water pierces the outer envelope the waterproof shell then you're going to have huge major issues And the third reason why most builders build with concrete block and why it's beneficial to you and your home is that it's healthier. Concrete is actually one of the greenest materials out there. It's low VOCs, it's harder for mold to grow, and it's harder for allergens to get in from the outside. In general, it's going to create a much healthier space in your home for you and your family. And the other thing about concrete too is it lasts a long time. So, you know, you had the, uh, the Greeks were using an early version of concrete and the, you know, Romans and that, and they, they basically discovered that when they built their fires in the morning after the morning dew would set, they would have this hard crust and they realized that the lime would get fired and then it would get hydrated, rehydrated. And then this was the beginning of concrete. A lot of concrete structures from that time period are still falling apart and chipping and everything. The technology for uh, cement uh, concrete work is expanded and it's gotten very, very scientific. And the current modern day 21st century concrete structure is far superior to anything that we've ever had before because it, it's all reinforced concrete 
There's a very exact science on the exact placement of reinforcement steel bars within the concrete. The mix design is such that you can get very specific with, you know, how flowable it is, how fast it cures, how many pounds per square inch, uh, how much strength it has, uh, the PSI, how strong this concrete is. You can, you can really dial that in depending on what it is you're building. There's actually many different types of concrete construction that we're not even bringing up in this video. In fact, if you want to know some more, you can let us know. But just to throw one out there, post-tension concrete. This is a system of concrete where you have slabs with really long spans and they put steel cables in them and you've got, an ex and you've got you know, the, the slab is actually allowed to, to move to a certain point, but it's all very engineered. Um, a lot of parking structures have stuff like that, post-tension concrete, a lot of condo buildings, stuff like that. But there's, it's such a, an incredibly scientific area compared to what it used to be. So just to add to what Dominique was saying, as far as, you know, the sustainability and green building, good for the environment, totally legitimate point. But my point is, is if you, if you spend a little bit more money to get concrete, uh, you know, and build a house out of concrete, you're talking about a, a hundred plus year build is being built to last for a long, long time. So for some bonus information for you, we're going to talk about the FEMA 50% rule, which is, it's a rule down in Florida that can be very restricting on the amount of renovations that you do on your home. So before you purchase a home or before you move forward with a renovations project, you should definitely understand this rule so that you know exactly how much you can invest in your home renovation. Uh, don't pay anyone to do any designs or drawings or anything until you've got this figured out. The FEMA rule, it basically means you can't do improvements to the house that would exceed 50% of the value of the structure. The basic purpose of the FEMA rule is, is if you bought a house or own a house, which is, you know, to, is determined, which is below the BFE, you know, then it's a high risk house and they only let you put 50% uh, of the value of that house into the renovation because at the end of the day, they don't want to cover a whole bunch of costs when that, you know, if and when that big storm comes. It's really important to kind of understand a little bit of the background of it, and then you can start to think with it. So, you know, after Hurricane Andrew, which I think was in the early 90s, um, there was a, a lot of damage from the hurricane down there in Homestead, uh, Miami, Florida, that area, Southern Florida. This is when this kind of started. In this area, you know, our, our height above sea level is not that high. We don't have any mountains in Florida. Um, if we, there was a tsunami, we'd be underwater. Um, so you've got flood charts. Uh, FEMA makes these flood charts and they show, it shows how high the water is going to be depending on where your house is from storm surge if we were to have a hurricane with storm surge. Um, a lot of the houses out on the beaches and the boundary island, uh, boundary waters on the little islands and stuff, uh, most of those would have uh, water six feet high in their living room. Now, most of those houses were all built in the 50s, some of them a little later. Um, and at that time, they either didn't have accurate flood charts or they didn't really pay attention to them because they never had a hurricane docu on you know documented hurricane that caused any amount of damage and they would just scratch the dirt pour the footings and build a house and then 20 30 40 50 years later a hurricane or two comes by storm surge hits and everything is completely ruined what happens is is the homeowners will now go to their insurance companies and if you get 40 to 50,000 clients going to an insurance company that's a pretty big bill to cover and the insurance companies tap out and the insurance companies basically go to FEMA and say, hey, we need help. We got all these people that got their houses wrecked. FEMA says, okay, well, we're going to help you out. We're going to bail you out. But moving forward, all of your clients that have houses that were built at this time period below the base flood elevation, which we call the BFE, well, they're going to have to conform to our improvement rules moving forward. So that's basically the, the birth of the 50% rule. And different towns, different municipalities kind of administer this overall federal FEMA rule in different ways, which makes it really nice and extra complicating. It's awesome. Some cities want you to go 49%. You know, they want you to have this contingency 
And some of them will say, well, hey, you can do, you know, 50% and then you can do this improvements on your house. And then there's a, after that, you close the permit and there's a one year wait. And then some cities are like, ah, let's make it five years. And then some ones, fifth, Oldsmar's 15 years, as far as I know. And then some of them are like, ah, oh, just finish the permit and uh, close the permit and then just come back in the next day and pull another permit for, you know, so, but what the 50% rule is, is they're saying, we're, if your house is below BFE, okay, if it's below the base flood elevation, it's one of these old houses that has livable square footage that's below where the flood charts say that water will come when we get a hurricane. If you have one of those houses, you can only do improvements to that house up to not to exceed 50% of the value of the structure. Now, this is the next point, which is very, very important. It has nothing to do with what the retail value is of the house. If you went and sold it for uh, uh, your house for $10 million tomorrow, it doesn't mean that you, somebody could use it to $5 million re remodel. It's you have to get the appraisal. Usually on the tax appraiser website, there's always an appraisal on there. And it's always extremely low. It's just like bare minimum. They don't put any effort into it or, you know, they just use whatever information they have online. They do a value of the structure. And then they come up with this magic number and it says the depreciated cost of improvements. Now, if you get a bank appraiser or a private appraiser, Nelson Construction, we have uh, two or three guys that do private appraisals specifically for builders that are working within the floodplain. So they're going to use everything ethically in the book to put as much value in that thing as they can to get the value up so that there's more on the 50% rule. Now, it's... The number you're looking for is the depreciated cost of improvements. It's usually somewhere down between page seven and nine on the appraisal. And it says depreciated cost of improvements. You're going to cut that number in half. And that's all they're going to let the builder permit with.